Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Planetarium show, the last show of this year. Um, uh, I'm Jessica. I'm the director of the Planetarium. With me tonight, uh, a familiar face if you've been to shows before, been with us. God, how long have we been streaming now? Almost two years? Uh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, uh, but, 21 months somewhere around there yeah it's kind of crazy um but i will let him say hi and introduce himself to anyone who's new here hi i'm Eli. i'm a physics and astronomy student at umd so tonight we are doing um another edition of our exploration series uh with the series we're looking to kind of do a deep dive into particular topics, especially those that were requested by you guys or ones that we tend to get lots of questions about. Um, so for example, we've done one on black holes because we always get asked about black holes. Um, we've done one on specific planets. I think we did Mars right before uh, Percy and Ingenuity landed. Um, so it's been a lot of great fun. Um, and tonight is all about nebulae. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eli, who's going to be leading our show tonight. Um, but as always, if you have any questions throughout the show, feel free to leave them down in the comments. I will be keeping an eye on those and we'll let Eli know if questions come up and we'll also have time at the end for them as well. Uh, so with that, Eli, it is all yours. Okay, so this is kind of embarrassing, but right off the bat, I'm going to step out for a second because I feel like my lips are going to fall off. I really need chapstick. <laughs> I've been like scouting out to see if I have any around me and I don't think I do. So I'll be right back in like five seconds. Okay, you're good. <laughs> All right, well, um, it's just us for a couple seconds. Um, like I said at the beginning, this is going to be our last show of 2021 as we are taking the last two weeks of December. Um, or the last weeks of December at the very beginning of January off for the holidays so that staff can have some time off and enjoy uh, the holidays with family and friends. And hello, Eli. Um, all right. That's all for me. <laughs> this chapstick, chapstick tastes super weird. It's um, um, Sweet Martha's, like from the state fair, they make a chapstick. And it like actually tastes like chocolate chip cookies. It's really weird. Hmm. Um, but it kind of throws me off every time. Um, okay. Bring this out. Okay, and how does that look? Looks good. Okay, cool. All right, so welcome to Exploring Nebulae. Um, like Jessica said, this is... Uh, another addition to our exploration series, um, which at first we would um, just kind of pick topics on our own volition and uh, things that we thought were particularly mysterious and people would probably want to hear about. But um, this one was actually specifically a request. I don't know from who. It was one of our regulars, wasn't it? I believe so. And yeah, I don't remember who either. Well, I hope they're here right now because um, this is for you. Um, so first off, um, let's talk about what a nebula is. And a really cool thing about this presentation is that there's going to be awesome pictures throughout the whole thing because nebulae are totally beautiful. Um, so a nebula is a large cloud of interstellar gas and dust, um, and they form in a variety of ways. We'll talk about those later, um, but the hallmark of them is, again, just like massive clouds of gas and dust. And like when I say massive, I'm like shockingly large, like um, thousands of light years across and um the other interesting thing about them is despite their huge size they are so so thin like they have such a low density um and uh they do some pretty interesting stuff um as we'll talk about in a bit um but the name uh nebula comes from the latin word nebula which means like mist or fog or exhalation which i thought was interesting um but uh yeah um I first want to get out of the way how we study nebula and just give some context for how we know everything we know about them. Um, and there are a couple ways, sounds like the Air Force is flying overhead. Um, there are a couple ways that we can um, study things uh, in space using light. Um, and uh, you're kind of looking at it right here. So um, whenever you have a black body, and a black body is just an object that emits a continuous spectrum of radiation. So like any light bulb in your house, the sun, uh, I'm trying to think of other black bodies, a fire, anything like that. What'd you say? Planets, yep. Um, they all emit black body radiation. So a continuous spectrum, all the colors. Um, and 
you know, even further than the colors, we can, you know, see a spectrum out into the infrared and the ultraviolet and stuff like that. Um, but uh, weird things happen when um, you get uh, you get things in between you and the black body, or it's not exactly a black body or something like that. Um, so in the case of a hot dilute gas, so if you have a big cloud of gas and it's really hot, um, it's going to give off what's called an emission spectrum. Um, which means that um, whenever an atom gets energized or heated up to a certain point, it releases a, pho a photon, a particle of light of a very specific color. Like for example, hydrogen, one of its most common emissions is a, a red photon. Um, so sometimes when we look at a cloud of gas and we take a spectrum from it, um, we get something like this, which is called an emission spectrum, which tells us A, that it is a hot dilute gas, and B, we can look at what colors come off or what wavelengths come off and we can say, oh, well, if it's releasing that wavelength and we know that that wavelength comes from hydrogen, there's probably hydrogen in the cloud. Um, another thing that can happen is if we've got a cold gas um, in between us and a black body. So say we've got a star really far out and then there's a big cloud of cold gas in between us and the star. We will see what's called an absorption spectrum. So the black body, like up here, releases a continuous spectrum of light. And then once that continuous spectrum of light passes through the cool gas cloud, some of the photons are gonna get absorbed by those atoms and then they'll be missing from the continuous spectrum. So kind of the, uh, the opposite analog to the emission spectrum. We know that some elements absorb certain wavelengths. And if we see those wavelengths missing from the continuous spectrum or you know, the absorption spectrum, um, after it passes through a cold gas, we can we can venture to guess. Oh well, if red is missing or you know something like that, there's probably hydrogen or you know carbon or whatever. Um, so that's kind of how we know some of these things that we know about nebulae, specifically their composition. And you can also get things like based on the relative strength of the lines, you can get a good estimate for how dense it is, um, things like that. But this is a, a pretty big component of our study of nebulae and how we know what we know about them. Um, so let's take a, turtle, a little uh, trip down history road here, um, and uh, we uh, can talk about the history of nebulae and um, specifically them being discovered. Um, so although many objects, uh, including galaxies and star clusters and things like that, have been observed for centuries and called um, quote unquote nebulous objects, because when you look at them with the naked eye, they, you know, you can see like if you are in an area of the world where you can see the Andromeda galaxy and you get a look at it, it looks just kind of like a little fuzzy spot. So rather than being a distinct point in the sky, they would call it nebulous. You know, it kind of looks like misty. Um, so for a long time, things were described as nebulous objects, but it was not until much later that the first actual nebula, as we define them today, was discovered. Um, this was done in 1610 by French astronomer and basically science savant and apologize, I apologize if I mess this up. I took French in high school, but I don't think it's taking me that far right now. Um, Nicolas Claude Fabry de Peres, that's how I would guess, um, through his personal telescope, um, he saw the Orion Nebula. And this was done in collaboration with a lot of his contemporaries, including Galileo. Um, and uh, it was kind of an independent effort. Uh, 50 years later, Dutch physicist and astronomer Christian Huygens, um, who, I don't think at the time was like a royal astronomer, but I think at one point in his life he was, or he was, he was the assistant to Ole Romer, who was a royal astronomer. Um, and Ole Romer actually was kind of one of the first people to get a good idea for the speed of light. But um, uh, anyway, Christian Huygens, 50 years later, completed the first detailed study of Orion, uh, or of the Orion Nebula, making due note of its nebulous appearance and creating kind of an accurate description for the first close to accurate description of nebulae in general. Um, after Huygens' first description of the nebula, astronomers around the world were doing their best to kind of discover the, and describe them on their own. And while many famous astronomers, including Halley, Chazot, Lacalle, uh, made kind of like incremental contributions to the catalog of objects, um, none were as successful as Charles Messier. Um, Messier uh, located, described, and cataloged 103 and again, quote unquote, nebulae, uh, but many were found later to be actually galaxies of their own. Um, but actually of those 100 um, something, I think it was incrementally increased to like 110 or something around there. 
um, 10 were actually true nebulae. So he still made a pretty big contribution. Um, I would say kind of the apex of nebular discovery came in the second half of the 18th century with the Herschel siblings, um, William and Caroline, and their massive catalogs of nebulae and star clusters. Um, they published a I think you would probably call it more like a book than an essay, but uh, 1,000 new nebulae and clusters of stars in, or in 1786, followed by another 1,000 in 1789 and some 500, I think somewhere around 512 more in 1802. Um, so they, uh, they found a very good amount of them. And from here, it was not so much uh, discovering nebulae anymore, but studying them and kind of thinking about what they were and trying to figure them out. Um, this kind of came to a head um, in the 1920s during what was called the Great Debate. Um, so after the discovery of thousands upon thousands of nebulae and specifically spiral nebulae, which hint, hint, weren't actually nebulae, um, the Great Debate between American astronomers Harlow Shapley, who we actually have, Jessica, I don't know if you know this, but we have one of Shapley's textbooks in the planetarium. Yeah, uh, I remember like, you telling me about that. Like, I, we need to do some cool, like, display with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Harlow Shapley was a very, uh, very influential um, astronomer. There's a class of galaxy named after him. Um, and uh, we have one of his, and it's a really old book, but we have one of his books in the planetarium, which is really cool. Um, but it was between Harlow Shapley and Herbert D. Curtis um, concerning the nature of spiral nebulae as compared to others. Um, Shapley held, the, and this took place in 1920 at the Smithsonian, um, Shapley held that spiral nebulae were actually just nebulae um, in the outskirts of the Milky Way galaxy, um, and he reasoned that since they looked so far away, um, the Milky, Ga Milky Way galaxy was actually probably much larger than we thought it was at the time, um, and Curtis asserted that spiral nebulae were in fact galaxies of their own residing far outside of the Milky Way. Um, as it turns out, Curtis was correct. And his theory was confirmed by astronomer Edwin Hubble later that decade when Hubble confirmed that these spiral nebulae, which later went on to be called spiral galaxies, were receding from the Milky Way itself. Um, and that, that kind of discovery was much larger than the scope of this slide. It has pretty big bearings on the field of astronomy, but um, that's maybe another show. Um, I mean, I would just add just context of we legitimately did not know if the universe was beyond our own galaxy. Yeah. Right. And so with this discovery by uh, Hubble, who could not have done it without Henry von Levitt, by the way. Yeah. Um, I always got to give her credit for that. Um, with that discovery, our universe became exponentially larger than we ever thought. Yeah. Um, which is just, I mean, that that that's why he's known for this. Yeah, yeah. Hubble is one of the biggest names in astronomy, and that that discovery on its own was kind of, I would say, kind of the beginning of cosmology too. Um, oh, it absolutely and, was. Yeah. So it's it's. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty big. Maybe we should do a show on that, actually. That would be cool, um, especially because Cepheid variables are so hard to understand. Um, okay, at least they are for me. I don't know if that's general. But um, so now that we've gotten the history out of the way, um, we can talk about the types of nebulae and kind of interesting things about them. Um, there are four types, I would say, but two of them, or there are five types, but two of them are kind of the same thing. Um, but uh, we'll talk about them distinctly. Um, there are emission nebulae. Um, which I kind of lumped together with planetary nebulae. There are reflection nebulae, dark nebulae, and supernova remnants. Um, so first, we'll take a look at emission nebulae. So emission nebulae are um, big clouds of gas um, and then very, very large, thousands of light years across um, with hundred, as you can see, there are hundreds to hundreds of thousands of solar masses of gas within them that are heated from the inside um, through some means or another. Um, and they're heated to the point of ionization. Um, when you ionize a gas, um, you provide it with enough energy to excite its electrons. And when you do that, it, the electrons jump and they release radiation. And um, that radiation comes out as light to us that we can see. Um, so the colors of the nebulae depend on how energetically they are being heated up from within. If there are, you know, 
kind of cold stars that are supplying just enough energy to heat it up. It'll be mostly red. And then the more energetic it gets, you can see greens, blues, yellows, things like that. Um, they, uh, they form as big clouds of gas from the inter interstellar medium pull together. So you've got, you can think about this, just this kind of thin distribution of gas um, throughout the galaxy. And in some places, you know, where there's more stars at a certain time, or if there's just a larger accumulation of gas in one spot, that gravity will just kind of pull those clouds together and they'll form these big nebulae. Um, and uh, emission nebulae, these massive clouds form just when that gas from the interstellar medium just kind of comes together. And that's standard for a lot of the other types of nebulae too. Um, and uh, it may um, become stellar nurseries uh, if enough material accumulates, if it gets dense enough, if there's enough gas in a small enough area, um, they will start to pull together and form new stars. Um, so that's kind of what you can see in this picture. You've got a really dense cloud of gas and dust, and then you see these bright blue stars going all throughout it. It's turned into a stellar nursery. It's very pretty. Um, so that's an emission nebula. Um, and kind of lumping in together, we've got planetary nebula. Oh, that picture came through really awful. I'm so sorry. Um, so first off, planetary nebulae have nothing to do with planets. Uh, the name kind of comes from their general shape and structure. They're, they're usually mostly circular. And so people with probably bad resolution on their telescopes said they looked planetary and they have nothing to do with planets, um, but that's their name, unfortunately. Um, but um, they, like emission nebulae, are clouds that are heated from the inside, but from very different means. Um, planetary nebulae form around old, dying, red giant stars as they expand outwards and shed their outer layers of gas. So as the outer layers of gas kind of puff off, the star starts to emit a lot more UV radiation, or just kind of a lot more radiation in general. And uh, that UV radiation heats the cloud from within, and it, it ionizes and starts to glow. Um, they're very short-lived because they are dependent on the stellar evolution going on within them. And they say that the uh, planetary nebula stage lasts somewhere around 10,000 years. Um, and because this gas shell is just expanding outwards super fast, like kilometers per second. Um, and uh, the star in the middle oftentimes becomes a white dwarf and ceases to illuminate the cloud. Um, on average, they're about one light year across. So they're kind of small in terms of, um, in terms of other nebulae, and this kind of is shown in how many of them we find, um, especially considering how short-lived they are too. We only know of some couple thousand planetary nebula in the Milky Way, whereas we know about a lot of other types of nebulae. And uh, we think this is because A, they're pretty small, so they're kind of hard to see, and B, they're just so short-lived. It's, you know, there's just not a ton of them there um, at any given time. And this is kind of a little video, which is also awful quality, just kind of showing how a planetary nebula comes about. So you've got this star in the middle um, and it starts to puff off its outer layers of gas once it restarts. Oh, this is a longer clip than I thought it was. Do I have to restart the slide or something? No, okay, so the star kind of starts to puff out its outer layers. And then inside you've got what I assume is, you know, the evolution to the white dwarf stage of the star's life. Um, Gas is just not very thick anymore. White dwarf isn't giving off a lot of radiation and the cloud kind of fades out into nothing. Um, they think that's uh, possibly what's gonna happen to our sun when, uh, when it goes boom. Well, actually it doesn't go boom, that's kind of the point. Um, so we've also got reflection nebulae and these are probably my favorite. I think these are pretty interesting. Um, so much like emission nebulae, there are these big interstellar clouds of gas and dust um, that reflect nearby starlight. Um, they're not illuminated from within. Oops, see. They're not illuminated from within um, as emission nebulae are. They're illuminated from the outside. And um, I actually just read this today and I did not know this, um, or, you know, I had tucked it back into the recesses, um, but they're composed of shiny reflective dust, some kind, sometimes called diamond dust, because um, they're made of um, a lot of like carbon compounds. Um, and uh, they've also got like a bunch of metallic particles. Um, and another interesting thing is the metallic particles are often aligned with the galactic magnetic field. And so that's one way they can identify these things is if it looks like the light is reflecting at a certain angle or something like that. Um, and they can tell that the dust is lined up a certain way. And they know that there's probably these metallic particles in there, which is kind of cool. 
Um, they're oftentimes blue, and that's because dust and gas scatters blue light more effectively than red, just like the same reason that Earth has blue skies. Um, and the size is pretty variable. It depends on gas cloud and illumination source and things like that. Um, so kind of the counterpart to reflection nebulae are absorption nebulae. Um, they, much like reflection nebulae, are very dense clouds of gas and dust in the interstellar medium. But instead of uh, reflecting light at us, they block light from getting to us. Um, they're these very big, cold molecular clouds, and um, they block most forms of light. Sometimes radio and infrared can make it through, um, but that's just about it. Um, they are oftentimes dense enough to become star forming regions at uh, later parts in their evolution. Um, they have a lot of complex molecules in them and they are massive, um, hundreds of light years across, millions of solar masses. Um, and they kind of are reflection nebulae just at a different angle. So like if the star is in between us and the nebula, it would look like a reflection nebula because then it would reflect the light at us. But if the star is on the opposite side, it would look like an absorption nebula. It wouldn't let any of that light through. Um, we've also got supernova remnants. Um, and that picture came through, unfortunately, not great quality either. Um, when we come back from the presentation, it's my Zoom background and it's better quality. So I'll show you that. Um, they are the results of the death of massive stars. Um, the shock wave outwards from the supernova blows all this gas and dust around the star outwards, um, energetically heats it to the point of glowing. Um, and the gas moves so fast, like 10% of the speed of light um, and millions of degrees. Um, and uh, they last for a pretty long time um, as that gas expands outwards. Um, and they can take a bunch of different sizes and shapes uh, because those explosions are pretty chaotic events. Here's a video illustrating what one could look like um, pretty quickly. So you've got a supernova, you see the big flash, and then you see this gas expanding outwards very rapidly um, and turning into that kind of cool colored cloud. Um, and then to close things out, um, I've just got a picture of one of my favorite nebulae um, and some context behind it. This is the Veil Nebula. Um, now, I don't know if anyone here is of the age group where they played um, Pokemon, oh God, what would it have been? I think that was Pearl. I think uh, if you would have played Pokemon Pearl or Diamond, but there was a there was a Pokemon in there called Deoxys, and this is probably meaningful to no one, but it, for some reason this nebula reminds me of that Pokemon, um, so I I think this one's my favorite. Um, kind of looks like a DNA, like red and blue, circling itself. Kind of cool. Um, and we almost did our Jessica, we almost did our um, 2050 project on this before we realized that that would be way too hard. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. So that's the Veil Nebula. Um, now I am going to stop sharing and then you guys will be able to see there's a supernova. Oh, oh, stop. There we go. There's a supernova remnant. You can, this is kind of emanating from in here. There's probably a white dwarf in here somewhere. Neutron star. Is it a neutron star? Yeah, supernova. So it has to be a neutron star. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so. Um, so just just a point of clarification on the different types. Um, the different types stem from two ways of describing them, uh, whether we're describing them based off of where the light is coming from. That's where you get your emission, reflection, or dark, or absorption, or the same thing. Um, or if we categorize them based off of how they were created. That's where yeah. you get your planetary, your supernova remnant, your um, stellar nurseries, those sorts of things. So you can have nebulae that are multiple types, as we were seeing with the planetary nebula, is also an emission nebula. Um, it's just different ways of talking about the same gas cloud. And you can also have nebulae that are multiple types. So um, one of my favorites is the Triffid Nebula, um, which is actually both uh, a, a reflection and dark and a uh, emission nebula all in one. Um, you have sections that are this really nice, pretty red. Are you pulling it up, Eli? Yeah, it's super cool. Um, you have these really great kind of pinks and reds. That's the emission part where you have the, the hot hydrogen. Uh, you have parts of it that are blue, which is reflecting the blue light from the stars. And then you have the dark streaks from the, the darker, um, thicker clouds within it. So you can have like all of those different types within one as well. So let me...
Do you want to show it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what they're talking about with north here because there's no north in space, but. No, but um, you can see it if you click on the, the one to the left of it. Yeah. So you can see the pink from the emission, the blue from the reflection, and the dark streaks of the dark or absorption. Mm -hmm. So this gas, the dark streaks are in between us and the light source in the middle, whereas this is like behind it, and this is kind of surrounding it. That's super cool. And this is all a stellar nursery. This is mm -hmm. where stars are being born. So we have a yeah. stellar nursery, nursery nebula that is depicting the three different types of nebulae that describe how the light comes to us, or doesn't in the case of dark. That's so cool, man. <laughs> that doesn't look real. No, I don't think that is. Yeah. Pillars of creation. Mm -hmm. Is this uh Isn't that butterfly? The Karina? Oh, that might be butterfly. I thought this was the Karina Nebula. Yeah, no, at this point we can just see beautiful gas clouds. Um, but that's where... Oh, the pillars of creation are in the Karina Nebula. I did not know that. Are you kidding me? So wicked. Uh, okay, so we just got a question. Um, and a comment. Um, my favorite is the classic Eye of God Nebula. That's a good one. Um, and then the question is about the colors. Is it really like this or is it enhanced? So these beautiful pictures that we're seeing are enhanced. Um, that's one of the struggles with trying to look at nebulae through just a telescope with your eye. You're not going to see these vibrant colors because the gas is so thin that they're not giving off a lot of light and it's not enough for your eye to pick up on the individual colors. So you see just a fuzzy clout, hence where the name came from um, and the whole, you know, nebulous in appearance. Um, so what we're seeing with the pictures um, is it, it is colors of light being emitted by the gas, but this is pictures that were, were taken over hours, sometimes days of yeah. staring at an object so that we could get enough light to really see those colors and see those structures. So while it's not what you would see to your naked eye, it's not fully false either. Um, like that's those, not... The colors are accurate. Like it's what the colors look like. It's just we can't really pick it out. I, I will. I will hesitate to say that's uh, that's not the case for all pictures, though. No, 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 no. Um, there are false color images, and those tend to do to deal with um, if you're not looking at just visible light, but you're looking at, for example, light specifically coming from hydrogen, specifically coming from oxygen, um, mm -hmm. coming from specific elements, what they'll do is they'll assign those specific colors. So hydrogen will usually get red because hydrogen usually does glow red. Um, oxygen, I think is usually green or blue. Uh, um, or if it's molecular oxygen, it's blue. I don't know, but they'll assign specific no, colors. Right. Um, you'll also get um, false color images if you're looking at things that are outside of visible light. Yep. So if you have like an infrared image, our eyes can't see infrared. And so what we do is we assign a false color to the, to the signal um, to make something pretty out of it. Yeah. Um, so a, a long, long answer to your question. A lot of them are true color, um, just enhanced so that we can see that color. Some pictures, though, are not true color. Yeah. And the, I, I like another interesting consequence of that is like if you were out there, like if you were in the nebula, you it like you would not be able to tell. Like it would be like yeah. you were right here. Um, it's only because we're outside and we take a bunch of pictures of them that we get those colors. They're like, like the, the I say they're dense, but that's like denser than the space around them. Like the, the, the densest of nebula or nebulae are still 
less dense than the best vacuum we can create on earth like there it's so jarring how little stuff there is but then we get enough stuff in the right spot at the right time and <laughs> you get stars yeah um to the, all right the so genius another one um is there a word for the mimicry of design across a range of natural objects blood vessels tree rivers um and as i'm seeing here oh. one of the nebulae seriously looks like the iris of the blue um so the one that you saw that looked like an iris very very much was actually fake um it was digitally painted to enhance the idea that it looks like um not that one there was one that one yeah yeah no that, um, that's fake this this is what it actually looks like which i mean still still does yes weird how much but there is a word for that isn't there that, i think there is but i don't know it off the top of my head i'm gonna try to find it um but i don't know how much of that is nature and how much of that is our brains liking to find patterns. Yeah, that's that's what it is. And there is a word for it. It's called pareidolia or pareidolia. Um, and it's uh, seeing like recognizable things and like random stuff. Um, it's why we people thought they saw canals on Mars. Yes. Yeah. And like, th yeah, it's it's the same with that. Uh, the like face on Mars like humans are just they have like an uncanny ability to like especially faces like pick faces out of stuff um it's really weird yeah um but there's also like something about like uh, like i think another way you could take the answer to that question is like taking like what's the number not avogadro's number um the perfect spiral oh um fee um, the golden um, ratio. The golden ratio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something about that. Like, you could take it that way, too. There are, there are just certain numbers that you see in nature that yeah, I mean, repeat themselves. And that comes down to just physics of the world. Yeah, just, yeah. There, there are some shapes and patterns that just are easy to create. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, um, if you look at, I mean, it's not really important. But uh, it's not really relevant to nebulae. But if you look at like sunflowers um, and like how the seeds are, oh, it's bringing me the Post Malone song from the Spider Man. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> you can see they like do this weird spiral business and it's super cool. Um, And like you can see these spirals, mm -hmm. and you know that they are like perfect spirals, like golden ratio. And there's like a ton of places you see stuff like that. Again, I think this has very little, if nothing, to do with nebulae. But but yeah, you do see patterns like this in, in this case because of just the simplicity, yeah. or just the way the math works. It's it's hard to explain. But. Yeah, and pine cones do the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And uh, pineapples. We haven't had pineapple in so long. Pineapple's really good. It makes I get canker sores really easy though, um, so I have to be careful. Now I'm just looking at pictures of fruit. Um, <laughs> All right. Um, uh, I will take one more kind of call for any last questions that people have. Go ahead and throw them down in the comments. Um, and we'll give that a couple minutes to see if any other questions come through. Um, and usually this is the time where I would promote our upcoming shows, but, um, we don't have any for a little while. Um, this yeah. is our last show of 2021, as I said at the beginning. Uh, we are taking the next two weeks off uh, to give staff uh, time off for the holidays, um, to spend time with family and friends. And thank you, Bridge. Appreciate oh, it. Oh, is it the bridge? Yeah. 
Um, but we will be back on January 5th um, with uh, back to our regularly scheduled twice a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays at 7 p.m. Central. And we will kick off uh, 2022 with our What's Up January on the 5th. And then on that Saturday, we'll have the January Constellations. Um, and I will say, I know we, well, a, a lot of us, I, I'm not talking for everyone, I, definitely myself, um, are thankful to be able to take a little bit of time off um, just from classes and, and streaming and everything. Uh, a lot goes into this. Um, if you've never dealt with streaming or doing shows like this, there, there is a lot involved in it. Um, so we appreciate kind of the, the support from all of you to take a little bit of time off um, to kind of just have some time off and, and spend the holidays with loved ones. Um, but we will be back and we are working on some really great stuff for the new year. Um, don't want to give too much away, but there is, if, if I can get all of our technical problems fixed, there is a really good chance we are opening for some public shows very soon in 2022, um, which I'm super excited for, but um, we, we've had a lot going on, um, upgrading systems, which led to some things not working, and it's just, it's been a lot, um, but hopefully we'll be able to reopen pretty soon with all our new fancy stuff and some great shows, some brand new content that we've never done before, and very excited, but we will keep streaming as well. Um, cause I know that there are people who still want us to stream. So we'll, we'll be doing a little bit of both, but we'll get more into that next year when we're back. Oh, I always feel so cheesy when I use that line. We'll see oh, yeah, you next the, year. Yeah. <laughs> like everybody like texts you that at like 1158. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm not saying any more questions come in, so I think we will wrap it up. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, again, uh, we will be back on January 5th. Um, so until then, have a wonderful holiday season, a wonderful uh, New Year's, and we will see you in 2022. Bye, everyone. <laughs>